Right, thank you very much. Uh, this is going to be a double act between myself, Claire, and uh, Gemma. Um, I'm going to introduce the site in general, and then Gemma's going to talk to you about all the amazing artefacts we've got from the site. So the talk is um, about the um, community research excavation that we've been doing on Lismore for the past probably seven years, I should think, or so. Um, and um, basically, we um, have been looking for St. Malougue's Monastery on Lismore. And I think, at the moment, this is a tongue-in-cheek, obviously, um, title. But basically, what we've got, what we've discovered on Lismore is incredibly exciting. And it's a really significant find. And in terms of the archaeology, um, OK, we've not done as much work. But in terms of the archaeology, I think we could quite legitimately say that Lismore is an extremely important site in the early Christian period um, and about the, um, in extremely important for um, introducing um, Christianity to Western Scotland and really can rival Lism um, Iona in terms of its importance. Okay, so this is the, um, this is Lismore and that building there is the um, medieval cathedral um, that was on Lismore, the first cathedral in Argyll. It's now the parish church. So when we first started, we were doing excavations where the nave is at the, this end here. Um, and so we had a couple of seasons doing the excavations there. And then we started talking about, well, why was the cathedral here? Why was it important? And um, there was this idea that the cathedral was placed on the location of St. Luke's um, monastery. So we started looking at the idea that maybe we could explore um, the area and see if we could actually find it and find any evidence of it. The only evidence really until then was an eighth century um, carved um, slab um, cross that uh, had been found um, in, the, in the current graveyard. So you can see here, this is the um, modern manse, which I'll we'll talk about that in a bit. And these are some of our trial trenches. And this talk mainly is going to concentrate on this trench down here. OK, so St. Maluk, he was an um, Irish uh, noble. He was a contemporary of St. Columba. Um, and he was um, around in the 6th century AD. So when we were um, thinking about this, we had to obviously have an idea of what makes, a, um, in archaeological terms, what makes an archaeological site, um, what makes a monastic site. Um, so we had to look for enclosure. All most monastic sites are usually enclosed, um, the sacred ground is enclosed. Um, there's evidence of burial. Um, you usually get stone markers, you get ancillary buildings. You get evidence of craft working, stone sculpture, metal working, and leather working. Um, a scriptorium, so um, where the illuminated manuscripts were made and you know, record keeping and that kind of thing going on. Obviously, you get the church and you get food production. So I'm going to go through this list very quickly. We've not got evidence of all of this at Lismore, but we've got quite a large proportion of these um, features that make a monastic site um, at Lismore. So what was our evidence for the enclosure? So this is not known as the vallum, and it's usually um, an earthen bank, a fence, a hedge, or a wall. So if you see here this red line, this is the current church, um, which is the cathedral. And that red line is current field boundaries, mostly, coming around here. And there was this idea that that might actually be the line of the original monastic vallum, the enclosure around the, the monastery. So what we did is we excavated some um, trenches around that boundary to see, test the theory whether the, that, that line that we can see nowadays in field boundaries and things was actually the line of, a, of, a, of the original enclosure. We didn't have much success, so this trench here we got this, what is in this picture is a, as a turf bank. Um, 
that was really the only ones. These ones here, we've got no evidence of any enclosure at all. Trench 9 is important for later on in that we've got um, buried under the peat, we've got a, a layer of cobbles, uh, limestone cobbles, which at the time we didn't understand what that was, but it, becomes, it became obvious later on when we um, excavated our later trench. Um, it was related to that. So really, um, this boundary here, certainly where we've explored it, the only area we've got evidence for a bank is in Trench 9. I'm not surprised really, though, because on Lismore, the bedrock is limestone and it outcrops very near the surface in lots of places, and it'd been incredibly hard to dig a ditch um, through that limestone. It would have been, in terms of the manual labour, it would have been just too much, especially when you're first setting up a monastic site. Um, using turf like we've got evidence for here, we're using your precious soil resource. So again, I don't think there'd have been much of a turf bank anyway. Um, putting in um, fence line would have been difficult because of the um, nature of the bedrock. So I think actually at Lismore, it well may, may, well, sorry, it might well have been a wall or even a hedge that enclosed the um, monastery. So what evidence we have for burial? So again, we've got a, an early um, estate map. So that's the church, and that's the current graveyard. And you can see there's graves marked in there. And in here, there's further graves. Now this, the line of the main road comes through roughly along there. And currently, this area is filled with the, uh, I think it was 1970s, early 80s, uh, a new manse was put in there. And when that new manse, this is it here, was put in, there was no archaeological uh, watching brief like you get nowadays done, but human remains were seen and kind of noted in the cut the photographs, but nothing was done about it. So um, we did come back and we put in a trench the first year just here, just to see whether we could get um, evidence of um, burial. And this is our very little trench we put in, but it was incredibly productive trench in terms of our knowledge. So we've got this nice wall here. We had burials above it and none below it. Um, so that wall appears to be contemporary with the uh, cemetery, enclosing that cemetery. We dated this burial here. That's all that's left is a couple of leg bones and kneecaps. The rest of it's been truncated, but those, those legs are still in situ. And then we had another burial here. We dated that one. This one here came back 7th century AD, which is really early, fantastic date for us, brilliant. Um, means we've got an early Christian cemetery here, which is really, really exciting. Um, and then the latest burial, certainly in this tiny trench, is 10th century. So it looks like it's a, it's a fairly short-lived um, period to that cemetery. And then over the top of it, we had areas of metalworking. We had a hearth in here as well, um, which dates to the sort of 13th century. It was probably when the um, cathedral was being built. This area was then used um, to house all the craftspeople and labourers associated with building the cathedral. So this trench was just a fantastic trench in that um, we've got this enclosed burial uh, cemetery, um, which really is fairly diagnostic of having an important church, probably monastic site. Um, on the um, other side of the, uh, the new manse, there's a stone, which is shown in pink here, is known as the um, sanctuary stone. So we wanted to dig around there and see if the cemetery expanded around that area. Um, and it did, and we got some probably um, 10th century burials here. You see them here, probably two brothers. <clears throat> we got evidence again of um, craft production and people basically living and, and, and um, doing activities over the cemetery. And again, I think this is, we're not dated this yet, but I think that's going to, again, relate to um, the building of the medieval cathedral. And we also got quite a lot of um, infant burials, which actually was very poignant in itself and slowed us down, so we didn't really get to the early burials in this, in this site. And we think these are probably fairly late. We know that they're sort of oral... Uh, records of them in sort of the 17th, 18th century being buried here. This is probably then out with consecrated ground at that time, but they're being buried next to the sanctuary stone. So there's a couple of the later infant burials. 
Um, so the other intriguing thing we've got is um, there's a stone here and a pile of bones. This is it uncovered. It's a really strange burial, this, in that some of the bone was articulated, others clearly um, disarticulated, so it had been brought together. So it was a combination of a disturbed burial then with other, other um, bones added into it. Um, and one of the leg bones, when we washed it, was quite intriguing. As you can see this mark here. And you can see some marks on here. Um, and then there's further marks. Basically, um, Ange Boyle, um, she's looked at this bone and she thinks these are sword marks. So basically, this poor person has had their legs hacked a number of times at by a sword. And there's no um, healing marks on this bone, so presumably that attack killed them. We've got no dating evidence now, but I'm hoping when we eventually do get some radiocarbon dates, this will come back Viking Age. Wouldn't that be a fantastic thing if it did? But we'll see. So, um, in terms of our evidence, again, so for a monastic site, we need to have um, grave markers and cross slabs. So, we discovered this piece here, which is a, a cross slab, um, like a pierced cross head. So, you imagine it's a big cross with openings there. This is rope sort of design in here. And this is quite intriguing. Um, it's almost like Pictish in design. Um, and there's parallels to this, this in Portland Mahonnock. Um, and then we've got this other piece that we found. Again, in the, um, it was in the soil covering up um, the cemetery. And this is um, eighth century in date. And again, interesting, has parallels with um, Nigan, Applecross, and Rosemarkey, which Rosemarkey's is, is, is meant to be a, a monastic site um, set up by St. Luke as well. So that's really, it is quite interesting. And shows that at Lismore, you know, there's, there's, there's all this interesting and um, important carving. You know, it's an important site. There's good stuff going on here. And here you can see this is a grave marker, so it's a headstone. And you can just see, we didn't, didn't excavate this one, we just wanted to make sure the cemetery extended in this area. You can see there's a top of a skull coming out there. So either side of that modern manse, both sides, as that old map showed, we've got the um, medieval cemetery around that area. So the next thing that we need would be ancillary buildings and evidence of specialist craft working area to make this a monastic site. Um, so we got some geophysics, rose geophysics, um, looked at the whole glebe area for us and found lots of different things. But one of the things they found was a, a, a round circular structure here and a rectangular, possible rectangular structure here. Now this area nowadays is just pretty boggy and pretty awful bit of the glebe field. So we were a bit sort of like, really? There'd be nothing down there anyway. So this is the trench we opened up, and sure enough, good old geophysics. So you've got a stone structure here, and then we had this linear, linear um, stone structure here. Um, and you can see this is the entrance, and we've got this beautiful, um, basically it's just like a stone roundhouse. And it's got different phasing. At one point, the roof burnt down. Um, again, we've not got any ready to calm dates from it here. But the nature of it, I mean, it potentially could be medieval. We have read medieval roundhouses in Scotland, but they're very rare. But I'm hoping it's going to come back early medieval and be contemporary with the um, early monastery. Right, I'm now going to hand over to Gemma, who's going to tell you all about the amazing finds. OK, so there was over 1,500 individual finds recovered during these excavations so far. And this includes a whole range of materials, metals, ceramic objects, glass, bone and stone. Earlier this year, I did an assessment of these finds just to get a, um, a basic idea of what is there, how much there is, and try and come up with a plan for what we would do for full analysis. So what follows is preliminary, and there will be a lot of detail to draw out of these in the future. The assemblage is really dominated by nearly a thousand fragments of non-ferrous metalworking debris. So 742 
ceramic mould fragments which were used for casting metal objects and 187 crucibles. The crucibles in particular are really well preserved. There are intact examples, which is very rare. And many preserve enough features to be able to have a close look at their form. These shown here with the unusual diagonal handles are so distinct. But there are other larger bowl types. Um, there are fragments with kind of subcircular lugs on them, which were probably the lids for crucibles. And all these types are readily paralleled at Donad in particular um, from 7th to 9th century AD context. The handled forms here are also seen at sites like the Brock of Bursay and Port Mahomek as well. So I analysed two of these using X-ray fluorescence XRF, just to get a quick idea of what might be going on, and the two that came back had been used for copper alloy. Um, given the nature of this assemblage and the other sites which it's similar to, I would not be surprised at all if, when we do a more extensive analysis, we find evidence for silver and gold working. It's just that kind of assemblage. The many mould fragments are not so well preserved and that's completely normal. Moulds tend to be made out of much softer clay and they were usually broken while the objects were being extracted. Diagnostic pieces include at least two different types of penannular brooch. Um, you can see two in this image. There's one which is for the back of a smaller penannular brooch with expanded terminals and there's another one there showing a more ornate expanded terminal with a central boss. And brooches like these were really the main form of personal adornment in early medieval Scotland. The most spectacular example, of course, being the Hunterston brooch and others like it. They were really miniature works of art. So the empty cells that you can see on the mould fragment we have from Lismore may well have gone on to be filled with really intricate filigree decoration or amber insets. We can kind of let our imaginations go a bit wild there. Other mould fragments included a whole range of things like um, hoop fragments, which are probably from other, maybe smaller, simpler, penannular brooches, rectangular frames that are probably from buckles, and all different shapes and sizes of flat plate mounts, which would have been attached to things like wooden boxes or leather straps. Um, but yeah, still lots to draw out there. In contrast to the rich non-ferrous metalworking debris assemblage, non-ferrous artefacts were actually surprisingly scarce and mostly relate to later um, high medieval period, like this copper alloy strap end you can see there and a cauldron leg and a couple of medieval pennies. It's not much of a surprise. You wouldn't expect to find brooches like the Hunterston brooch lying around in the, the dump of metalworking debris. But it is interesting there's no fragments of casting droplets um, or miscast objects, which possibly suggest that the raw material was um, still quite valuable and would have been reused rather than being dumped, despite the scale of activity going on. As well as non-ferrous metal working, there's iron working going on as well. So around 20 kilograms of iron working slag was discovered. And the types of slag present show that they were smelting iron, that is extracting iron from the ore, and also blacksmithing. So they were hammering that iron into objects as well. Iron working evidence is commonly found on monastic settlements, and particularly blacksmithing. And the blacksmiths would have been um, busy all the time making and mending all the different tools and implements they used. A range of iron artefacts were recovered and these are awaiting x-rays so we can't go into much detail there. There's obviously a lot of things like nails and other structural fittings and knives. Um, given the large quantity of craft working evidence on the site, I would not be surprised if there's things like awls and punches for craft working hiding in there. A 
A very small assemblage of eight worked bone and antler objects includes these two star finds from the site. And I have to say it was this photo when Claire sent me it that <laughs> got me really excited. My jaw hit the floor. Um, so these two pieces of bone have intricate decoration carved onto them, interlaced decoration. And they're a type of object known as a motif piece. Motif pieces were traditionally thought to be um, practice pieces for craft workers who were trying out designs that they would then go on to um, undertake on metalwork or carved stones. There's some of the pieces really are hard to parallel. The designs are hard to parallel on finished objects. But also, I just find it kind of unfathomable that these were practice pieces sometimes. Some of them are so beautiful in their own right that it seems um, unlikely that they were just a trial piece and then thrown away. Um, they're amazing things. They're just made on a piece of bone. Um, they've not been analysed by the bone specialist yet, so we don't know which, but it just looks like a piece of sheep or cow leg bone. Um, these are much more common on Irish sites. There are some from Scotland, but they're far, they are far sketchier. They're easier to believe that those are um, sketches for designs which were going to be carried out on something else. So there's none quite as good as these which have turned up in Scotland before. And I think these, along with a lot of the other finds, but these especially, I think, hint at just the um, high level of skill which was there on the site. And another object worth mentioning was this really unassuming piece of bone, which um, turned out to have a really fine scroll decoration on the end of it. So we think it probably was used as some sort of a stamp to stamp scroll decoration around a piece of leather maybe or ceramic. Um, I've not seen anything quite like that either. So another example of specialist craft working. It's also worth mentioning that alongside all these um, highly skilled crafts, there was normal stuff. There's fragments of rotary querns for grinding grain into flour. There are cobble tools, um, which show wear consistent with use as grinders and hammers. Um, a range of slate discs, which could have been used as pallets or pot lids, um, and a small one, which is likely a gaming counter. So there's evidence of normal daily life, if you like, as well as all this high-end craft working. And briefly, other objects I've not shown um, include pieces of waterlogged worked wood. Um, and I've mainly not shown them because my photos were so awful. <laughs> um, photographing soggy wood turns out to be very difficult. Um, and they include things like stakes with axe cut facets and pieces with drilled perforations through them. And that will be really exciting to study the types of wood used and the techniques used to work that because it so rarely survives. And um, it will be exciting to compare that with the types of sites that usually turns up on like Cranach sites. There's a small assembly of pottery, which mainly includes modern stuff from um, topsoil, but a handful of medieval green glaze shards and about 10 shards of what looks like prehistoric pottery, which um, could be much earlier than the early medieval stuff we've just been looking at. Um, and there is an early Bronze Age flint arrowhead as well. So there's clearly a scatter of earlier material there too. So just in summary of the finds, um, looking at the assemblage as a whole, the metal working debris, the carved stone cross fragments that Claire showed you, and the motif pieces really together illustrate a very high level of skill. And it's, they're really right up there with the other big craft working sites in early medieval Scotland. And even from an initial assessment, there's lots of parallels can be drawn with the better known sites like Iona, Port Mahomac and Whithorn, um, as well as non-monastic sites like Donad. And the Lismore craft workers seem to very much have been part of that circle of, of skill and connections. Closer study of these finds and all the fine details like the different alloys they were melting in the crucibles, the types of clay fabric they were using for the moulds and the construction techniques, um, the types of wood and bone and stone, all these details will help to draw out that range of connections and workshop habits um, that can be compared with other sites, but also be compared across time on the site on Lismore as well. So in summary, a really fascinating, exciting assemblage. 
particularly the craft evidence and a huge amount of under, um, potential to increase our understanding of aspects of early medieval Scotland, Argyll in particular, and especially Lismore, the broader history of Lismore as well. Just to say, um, it was a community-led research excavation, um, and I think it's a really nice example of what a community with incredibly limited budget, financed by the society on quite a number of occasions, um, you know, hard work and determination that a huge amount can be achieved and you can actually we, you know we, we, we've got this amazing site and i think um all credits the community for sticking at it you can see some of the conditions there we were working in it was pretty pretty desperate and everybody just gets on with it and seems to really enjoy it and i think um yeah they've done a fantastic job okay thank you